if people are noticing, like a parent is noticing a really big feeling mm -hmm. in their teenager, how can they mm -hmm. have a little bit more framework around whether that feeling is like too big and they need help mm -hmm. or if it's in a reasonable range of up and down? Um, it's a really tough question for parents to be able to assess in the moment. And, and the reason for this is that teenagers have incredibly potent emotions. And, and they just do. It's the nature of adolescence. And it's true for their positive feelings. You know, they're more like, yeah, about anything <laughs> than they will ever be again. But when, but when they're down, they are down. And it is scary. Um, so there's some things that are very, you know, Easy, easy red lines, right? Like, you know, if, if you have any reason to think the teenager may be a risk to themselves or others, like, obviously, like, yeah. you know, call out the brigades. Mostly what we want to see is that whatever mood a teenager has, it doesn't last that long. Uh -huh. That teenagers, you know, the term we use technically is are highly labile. You know, they move from one feeling labile. state to another. Yeah. And so what I want to see is maybe they had a rotten night and they were really upset and um, the parent was tender and empathic and supportive and listened and said, what would help you feel better? Mm -hmm. And the kid says, nothing, nothing will help me feel better. And then you say, okay, well, I'm gonna go watch TV. If you wanna join me, feel free. Yeah. If an hour later, it's as though nothing happened yeah. or the kid's actually gleeful about something, you're looking at typical adolescence mm. um, or the next day, right? I mean, they may have maybe really sad through the night. We only really worry about adolescent moods if they go to a concerning place and then hang out there. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to wait that long. I mean, two days is a really long time for a teenager to be, you know, deeply upset or paralyzed by anxiety or horrendously angry. You know, two days is a really long time in the life of a teenager. Yeah. So it's more around how, how long it lasts yeah. and less around the... Um, the depths of the emotion, yeah, because they feel things deeply. I picture like elasticity when you're talking, yeah, like the expanding, contracting. Yeah, you gotta ride it, and 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 I think the the challenge, the ideal response of a parent is very easy to describe, enormously hard to do. <laughs> it's to try to be a steady presence. Uh huh. So you have this kid who's having a massive emotion. Yeah. And even in the midst of that, part of what they're doing is they're reading the response of the adult. Mm -hmm. And if the adult joins them right there, you know, if the kid is deeply upset about how a grade came through or a breakup, and then the yeah. adult is just as upset. Like, this is the worst. The will they, like, will they match? The, it'll scare the bejesus out of the kid. Because the kid will think, like, I thought this was a 15-year-old size problem. This is apparently a 52-year-old size problem. Oh, right? so, no. so that's yeah. why, even if we're not feeling steady inside, Yes. If we can do our best to try to seem steady, uh -huh. um, that's a real gift to kids. Yeah. Um, so we want to try to do that, which often also means getting our own support and our own having our yes. own people to call. And I'm going to pretend to go to the bathroom and breathing deeply. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, that's the gift we can give them, yeah. is to not overreact, to try to help them maintain a sense of perspective by keeping yeah. you know, a grip on our own. Um, and would you describe yeah. that as like a, because I'm a, as you can already tell, like not great at robot <laughs> face. <laughs> like yeah. very stretchy, yeah. easy to read face. Yeah. So should someone like me go for like empathic and just empathic presence? A warm and not bananas? <laughs> I think my face would do a lot of things. Well, and of course our kids can read our faces <laughs> yeah. better than anybody. Yeah. I have... Um, Two daughters, my younger one, who's about to be 13, said to me recently, she's like, I can tell from the look on your what? face when you have stopped listening to what I'm saying and are waiting for me to pause so you can tell me something. And I'm like, I'm sure you oh can. Oh my gosh, you that, make such a good point that, about that. And I've been yeah. thinking about, I love your book, and I, I just I thought about it a lot when you wrote it. And I've been thinking about it in terms of like parenting and friendships, but like, you really don't want us to jump on, jump on the problem. No. Half a breath, quarter of a breath. At least, <laughs> at least. Because here's the thing, that's almost never what people want. And, uh -huh. and it's funny, I'll tell you an adult example, like I give a million in the book about parents and teenagers, but um, five, 10 years ago, I went to the funeral of a friend's father. It wasn't a tragedy, he was an old guy. We were all there as friends, you know, to support our friend whose dad had died. And I ran into a friend of mine named Mitha, and I hadn't seen her for a while. I'm like, Mitha, how are you? And she's like, I need back surgery. And I go, oh, Mitha, that sucks. Yeah. And she goes, thank 
thank you. Oh my God, thank you. She's like, everybody else is like, well, have you tried physical therapy? Yeah, <laughs> She's exactly. like, of course I have done all of those things. Like, oh my God. I just like signed up for back surgery. She's like, thank you for just agreeing yes. that this sucks. You know, and I was like, eh, there it is. Like, it is wild. Very rare. What a powerful <laughs> sentence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, that really, really sucks. sucks. She was like, oh, thank God. So I, I tried. Yes. But of course, in my own parenting, I mess this up like on an hourly basis. Well, you know? I will fix problems yeah. no one's asked me to fix. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I'm like taking apart a car and putting it back together, <laughs> and they're like, it was fine. It was fine. There's no reason. To, yeah. Another one that has extreme value for teenagers, it's valuable to anybody, but it has special value for teenagers, and I'll say why, is to say, anybody in your shoes would be upset. And so it's just, it's another version of just pure empathy, you know, it's not nice. adding anything. Yeah. For teenagers, they um, can find their emotions very destabilizing. And I remember in my training, um, I was in my postdoc or something, so I wasn't like totally new, but I was still pretty new as a clinician. And I had a senior supervisor say to me something that when she said it, I didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, that's not true. Mm -hmm. She said, you need to work with the assumption that all teenagers secretly worry that they're crazy. Yeah. And I was like, huh. Nah. And now over time I'm like, yeah, and, and I think it's because a couple of things happen in adolescence. One is that emotions were, that were not so intense become more intense. You know, 8, 9, 10, 11 year olds, oh like, gosh. they're cool. Like, yeah. you know, stuff doesn't really get to them. And so then you have a 13 year old who, as a function of neurological changes, is feeling things very, very vividly, but can remember being 11 and not losing it over oh the same gosh. thing they're losing it over now. So that's right. very concerning to them. And then at 14, and these are all like, you know, yeah. averages, there's a cognitive watershed, a neurological watershed, where um, a new gear gets added to their thinking. Like they add a dimension, they add the capacity for abstraction, and it's got nothing to do with intelligence, it's just mm -hmm. the brain developing. But they can start to think about thinking, and they can start to, you know, imagine strange things, and they can, you know, suddenly have very profound thoughts which for a lot of kids can be pretty weird. Oh, yeah. But so you have these sweet 13 and 14 year olds who are like, their feelings are on steroids, they're thinking thoughts they haven't had before. Yeah. It is scary for them. And so when they get upset, to have a tender adult say, anyone in your shoes would be this upset, is, it's a twofer. And here's the twofer. Like one is you're giving empathy, and the other is you're not crazy. Yeah. And, and that's really what they are needing to hear. Yeah. One of the other things I really like about how you frame the validation experience is with the precision of language. Because mm. I remember how much I've cherished it when someone says, um, you're upset because this is really upsetting. Mm -hmm. You're mad mm -hmm. because this is mm -hmm. infuriating. Mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. that was late in the game for me, but like mm -hmm. the right language to yeah. even try to shade in some of the colors of my mm. feelings mm -hmm. also really felt like that was I'm just thinking of the like things that made me feel not crazy can they have precision in there is it hard for them to match up the feeling that they're having mm. in their body with like the word I think it's hard for most people mm -hmm. I think um, there is a an interesting phenomenology around teenagers now that has emerged in the last 10 to 15 years where there's a huge amount of discourse around using mental health terms. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of um, social media arbitrated, yes. you know, sort of remediated Oh, I have anxiety. I have, uh, like, yeah. that kind of mass yeah. pathologizing. Yeah, or mass use of pathological terms to describe what may often be everyday experiences. Uh -huh. You know, and, and I say this, like, mostly just as an observer. You know, I... I, I, I I just like to watch what they do. Yeah. So one of the things is that I think it more now than even in earlier, like at this point I'm saying decades when I practiced, um, teens can be very quick to use terms like anxiety, depression, in this very, very broad yeah. way. And um, it can rub adults the wrong way. And I understand why, but what I would say is like, treat it as an opportunity. You mm -hmm. know, they've brought you to the neighborhood, right? <laughs> that, <laughs> like they're feeling uneasy <laughs> or they're feeling sad, like down. Yeah. And then your job is to help them locate a more precise house within that neighborhood. So you say you feel anxious. Okay, well now we're in the anxious neighborhood. Tell me a little bit more. Yeah. Oh, you're really angry at your, you and your friend are in a fight. 
or yeah. um, you're not sure what to wear to this party that you're really excited about. You know, so then you say, I hear that you feel anxious. I'm wondering if you're also feeling like really frustrated with your friend. Or I wonder if like you're anxious about the party, but also kind of like excited to go, you know. So yeah. it, we can just take it as an overture that allows us to home in on something more specific and blow past the fact that they may use these broad generic terms and they may not use them accurately. You know, as opposed don't... to being like, you're not OCD. <laughs> we haven't gone through that evaluation process. I'll show you OCD, right? <laughs> like, no, we don't have to do that. Um, yeah. And there's, there's, let me give you two good reasons why it's worth doing that. So one good reason is language on its own reduces distress. Mm. So the act of saying, I feel sad, I feel worried, you know, just uttering the word. We have objective physiological measures that tell us that the mere utterance of a feeling word reduces the intensity of the emotion. It's mm. kind of an extraordinary mm. and actually in many ways truly magical thing. Yeah. The other is thinking, Kate, like those people who you told how you were feeling, like I'm mad, and they're like, mad? You should be infuriated. Okay, that is a profound expression of empathy because they're like, I'll see you and raise you. <laughs> like, you, know, you think yes. you feel mad? I can actually listen so thoughtfully that yeah. I can return to you something even more precise than what you gave me, yeah. which means I was really listening. Yeah. You know, so then there's value. I feel value. known, yes. then I feel... Yeah. And what I love about all of it is like, it's not easy, but it's very economical. Right. This right? is all free. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> or, and it doesn't take that much time. It just doesn't take that much, right? Yeah. I think that people jump to the big project of like, oh, I have a friend who knows how to do back surgery in your area, right? As opposed to the like, <laughs> the smaller project. Of, like, <laughs> that's a perfect analogy. Because <laughs> yeah. right? yeah, I, I think the other temptation, I mean, especially if someone, I don't know, has an expertise in one thing, mm -hmm. then they hear it and they're like, ugh, I'm out of my league. Like, out of my league is a big feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And, and so I hope I can just offer reassurance. That's okay. People don't want your expertise, right? Like, they really don't. Like, <laughs> what they want is someone to acknowledge, like, you're in a pickle. Like, yeah. and I'm really sorry, and I care about you, and I wish it weren't this way. Yeah. Um, I do really love when people have the right term for what they experience. Yeah. Like, I had a friend recently who had a terrible travel experience, and I would have said it was some kind of, like, socially displacing emergency. And he was like, oh, no, I just got boondoggled. And boondoggle oh, is such a funny word such a about word. like a, yeah. like a dun 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 yeah. blah, feeling of like yeah. accidentally being waylaid. Yeah. And I was like, wow, the right word really does sort of paint the picture of what actually happened. Yeah, and and then contains it. Yeah. And makes it. You can play with it. You can show it to people. You can look at it from different sides. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's what therapy is at its best. I mean, all we have, the only tool we have, is yeah. language. Yeah. In the kind of therapy I'm trained in. Like and knives. Wait, not in therapy. <laughs> no, no, no. We have lots not of tools. In my, not in my office. <laughs> um, and, but that's why it works, yeah. right? Because as soon as you have an experience that yeah. felt amorphous or overwhelming or isolating and alienating, mm -hmm. as soon as you can um, bring it across into language, now you can go do all sorts of things with it. And that's like, that, I love my job right? yeah. because that's what we get to do. I was just thinking, I see so much joy, vocational <laughs> joy on your face when you talk about like, yeah helping someone find the right, yeah. like hold it up to the light in a certain way. Yeah, yeah, that's what, when we're doing our job well as clinicians, that's yeah. what we're doing. We're yeah. not fixing problems. We're helping people talk about what they've been through. Mm.